Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're here to welcome Prithvi Datta Chandra Shobhi to Berkeley. Uh, Prithvi works on the social history of medieval South India with a specific focus on dissenting cultures. He studied history and literature at Jawaharlal Jawahar Nehru University in Delhi and at the University of Chicago. Uh, Prithvi taught humanities at San Francisco State University before returning to India to take up a position at the Karnataka State Open University in Mysore, where he also runs the AWIS Kannada program. Um, Prithvi is the editor of several books, including a volume of essays on the Dalit movement and Dalit literature by the renowned D.R. Nagaraj, entitled The Flaming Feet and Other Essays, The Dalit Movement in India, which came out from Permanent Black a few years ago. Two collections of his Kannada essays on higher education and public history will be out shortly. Uh, he's also published extensively on the literature, culture, and politics of Karnataka, both in scholarly forums and in popular media. Uh, Prithvi is also a columnist for The Print and Prajavani, and is a group editor of a new intellectual initiative called Samaja Mukhi, which publishes a monthly magazine, uh, produces digital and television content, and also is a publisher of books. Prithvi's talk today is entitled Our Lingayat Hindus, a particularly pertinent question in a well-timed uh, lecture, since the question of minority status for Lingayats is a major flashpoint in the upcoming Karnataka Assembly elections, which will be held in a month and a half uh, from now. And as uh, if you watch Indian uh, news at all, they remind us relentlessly that the Karnataka election is a curtain raiser to uh, what promises to be a bruising election season for the 2019 general elections. So please join me in welcoming the three. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm very grateful for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, thanks to Munes, Sanchita, Punita, and others for making this happen. Uh, Berkeley is the place that I feel most at home in this world um, for many reasons that you know, many of you who are here know. So it's a great pleasure to be uh, here uh, back in Berkeley at the South Asia Center. Um, before I start my talk, I want to say a couple of things about some initiatives um, that I'm involved in, that I'm part of, uh, especially the AWIS Kerala program that was uh, that about. So there's a, as many of you know, there aren't many Canada programs uh, in the US, uh, with the exception of the one at UPenn. But um, one particular challenge that we have faced is the absence of curriculum materials um, for Canada, especially, especially because it has never been taught in, in, in the US, and Jason knows that. So, uh, so I was asked to. Uh, take charge of the AWS Canada program uh, three summers ago. So I've done three cycles of uh, Canada for introdu introductory and intermediate. Um, and uh, I also had an advanced graduate student who spent a year with us reading Canada text. So in the course of uh, doing all this, we have managed to uh, put together some curriculum materials and we have developed some competency in uh, uh, helping graduate students and, and scholars who come to myself. Uh, we are also hoping over the next year or two we'll be able to put together some of these material that we have uh, collected into readers, a glossary, a conversation, Facebook, and uh, an introductory and intermediate uh, textbook. Um, so I wanted to you know, place that on the record, and, and if there are people, graduate students, undergraduate students who are interested in studying in Canada, we spread the word and we'll help them out as much as we could uh, in, in Mysore. Um, there's one other initiative that I'm, I'm part of, and we're still working on details, and so I, I won't speak much about it, but in Bangalore, is CSC considering setting up an interactive Canada Center and a Canada Resource Center, which would uh, be a one-stop uh, resource center for all the knowledge that has been produced on Canada and on Karnataka. So that's the uh, ambitious goal that we have. It'll probably take a couple of years, three, four years to put that together, but that's something we are seriously doing. And you know, between the two uh, of these, we'll be able to do a lot of uh, Canada, Karnataka centric work uh, in Mysore and Bangalore. Okay, so that was something I wanted to share with you. Uh, so today, what I want to talk about uh, is about a recent controversy that some of you are familiar with. Um, and uh, 
you know, which has very serious implications on for a number of debates about uh, modern Indian historiography, uh, specifically about Hinduism and its relationship to other communities, right? How do we actually understand this thing that we call Hinduism? Is it a modern political community? Is it something which has more uh, uh, ancient origins? How do we establish those connections? Uh, more than you know, the, the phenomena, the, the entity called Hinduism, uh, there's also a question of how do we write histories of communities uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense. So uh, writing social histories of communities has been a remarkable challenge for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, partly because we have mostly either literary sources or theological sources. And so in light of that, right, what kind of geographical questions emerge is something that I'm deeply interested in. And so from that perspective, this controversy is of some um, interest. So the controversy arose because Lingayats, a dominant community in Karnataka, demanded minority status, arguing that they're not Hindus. Neither the demand nor the argument that they were making are new. But because of political reasons, it has become an explosive issue. <coughs> So what I plan to do in this talk is to talk a little bit about the controversy, then consider what the historical evidence says, uh, primarily using Kannada and uh, uh, Sanskrit sources, um, and then uh, return uh, to the uh, contemporary political scenario uh, to conclude, uh, in which uh, you know I mean we have to look at uh, what a variety of communities are doing across India, Patels in Gujarat. Jats in Haryana and Uttar Pradesh and Marathas in Maharashtra um, seeking a special status, either a minority status or a um, you know, backward caste status, uh, which would provide access to them to state resources, jobs, funding, and so on, or exemption from constitutional provisions, such as exemption from uh, uh, the right to education provisions that have been enshrined in, in the Constitution recently, or reservation provisions, and so on. So if you have minority status, then you don't have to follow right to education uh, restrictions, uh, or uh, in employment, you don't have to follow reservation provisions. And that's the appeal, actually, for uh, a variety of communities, including Jains, who got uh, minority status recently in 2014, and also for Indians now. So, um, I've written about four or five essays in the last eight, ten months on this controversy, so I'm trying to pull together uh, some of the arguments that I made uh, in those essays. Um, so let me begin with the, the question that you know, I posed in the title of uh, my presentation, are Lingayats Hindus? Even asking such a question may seem absurd. If you know Indian politics, if you know Karnataka <coughs> politics more specifically, because Lingayats have been, for over two decades now, the bedrock of Bhartiya Janata Party's electoral prospects in Karnataka. Right? They've been staunch supporters of, of BJP. They were among the most enthusiastic participants in the Ramjan Mabumbi movement, uh, sending volunteers as Karsevaks and bricks to build the temple at Ayodhya in the late 1980s and early 1990s. From the early 1990s onwards, all indicators suggest that Lingayats have consistently voted for BJP in large numbers. Okay. So much so that Lingayat community is now seen as a reliable vote bank for BJP in recent decades. So how could a community support the party of Hinduism <coughs> politically while asserting also its difference from Hinduism? Okay. That's the paradox, that's the contradiction that we are trying to understand. So I've argued elsewhere that Lingayats have constituted their modern identity, that created their modern identity, and uh, through that also unified various subcasts into Virashaiva Lingayats fold by stressing on their difference with Hindus. So this is the point I was making earlier. In the last 120, 140 years, Lingayats have, you know, um, have tried to overcome their subcaste differences. Um, most of these subcasts are also geographically distributed in different districts of Karnataka, and so there's not that much of a local uh, competition, uh, although electorally in some cases there have been competitions between um, um, candidates who come from different uh, parties but belong to the Lingayat community. But otherwise, uh, you know, there's been, uh, so this, this, this effort on the part of Lingayats to uh, unite sub subcaste um, is, is uh, particularly salient in the context of democratic electoral politics because numbers matter and so uh, that's something that can very, very uh, serious about. In the last 115 years, 
Akhil Bharata Virashaiva Mahasabha, which is the umbrella organization for Lingayats, has undertaken this as a major project. So, um, uh, so it is important to remember that you know the, the division uh, into sub caste sub communities has been a particular source of anxiety during modern times, and uh, they have tried various measures to uh, to unify them. And the significant discursive uh, move that they have made is is to argue that they are not Hindus, that they have a distinct identity. Uh, yet, we are having noted this, um, the debate over Lingayatism's relationship with Hinduism continues to re-emerge periodically as it is now since the middle of uh, June of uh, 2017. Um, so the most recent iteration of this debate was triggered by an innocuous question that Siddharamaya, the current Chief Minister of Karnataka, belongs to the Congress party, asked in a felicitation ceremony uh, that uh, the uh, All India Virashaya Mahasabha had organized in his honor. So, except he, in that, uh, as, you know, while speaking in that uh, uh, ceremony, in that function, he, he accepted a long standing demand of Lingayats that their community be declared as a religious minority, and he agreed to recommend the Lingayat case to the settled government. You know, this hadn't gone before the uh, cabinet, and they didn't do many of the other moves that they actually ended up making afterwards, including. Uh, you know, referring, uh, making the minorities department uh, ministry in, in the state of Karnataka to refer, uh, to constitute a separate subcommittee to go into this uh, subcommittee headed by, by a retired high court judge and a bunch of academics, uh, progressive scholars mostly. And uh, they submitted a report uh, two months later and, and you know, that was more recently, a, a month ago, accepted by this government and recommendations sent to the central government. But if you look at the context, right, Siddharamaya was being felicitated in this um, in this function because he had done um, uh, he had undertaken a couple of really important, significant, symbolic measures to honor Lingayats, and so um, the Lingayat uh, community wanted to repay that. Uh, and, and the measures were basically, you know, when when he took office in 2014. He took office on Baswanda's birthday, so you know it, it was a token gesture. And consistently, Siddharamaya has talked about how he is uh, indirect to Lingayat discourses, anti-caste discourses, in his own thinking as a formative influence in creating his political sensibilities and so on. Uh, so there's that, and he also mandated that all government officers should uh, feature Baswanda's photograph, uh, like next to Gandhi and Baker. So that's the whole trinity for for uh, Canada progressives for you know as long as I can remember, at least 40, 50 years. And so providing state recognition to that was an important thing. Uh, so what Sidramaya did by asking this question um, was to raise a very uh, uh, pragmatic concern that the state had. So um, he asked, which name should be used? Should we use the name Virashaiva or should we use Lingayats when we send the recommendation to the central government? So why is this important? Because Virashaiva, the name term Virashaiva had been uh, used before because whenever uh, uh, Lingayats had made uh, a request for a separate census entry while counting, you know, in the decennial census, or uh, when other demands were made uh, seeking a separate identity for uh, Lingayats. They had used the term Virashaiva, and there were specific objections that the central government had made, uh, saying, you know, the, the argument being put, put forth by the community doesn't make any sense because they are saying they're, you know, claiming, proclaiming themselves as Shaivas, and if that is the case, how could they be uh, different from uh, from Hindus? Right? That was the big question being raised. So uh, now um, Sidramaya asked, should we use the term Lingayat or um, Virashaiva? So Siddharamaya's question, in a sense, opened a festering wound within the community because I'll, I'll talk a little bit later you know, in the newspapers um, and in public debates. For several decades now, you know, every year there's um, a regular debate which unfolds on, on the status of Virashaivas and Lingayats. And it, it is a, an important uh, you know, question that gets revisited often. 
Uh, one thing I should state here, you know, about the uh, about how this came uh, to the forefront uh, in 2014. I just before the Lok Sabha elections, a few months before the Lok Sabha elections, I called the chief minister's office to ask them whether they were thinking about granting minority status to Lingayats or whether that was a demand that they would consider seriously. There was no interest. In fact, they laughed at me. You know, they said they didn't want to undertake this full salary. In fact, the, uh, the uh, Congress government at the center, the UPA government, rejected a demand made by the minorities department of uh, the UPA government, rejected the demand that uh, Lingayats had you know, made asking for minority status. So this was not on the horizon at all. And this is something which became much more important once Jats and Patels and, and Marathas began demanding reservation. But there's no way Lingayats could ask for reservation because um, I'll, I'll talk about that a uh, little bit later. So uh, uh, after, the con the after, after this controversy broke out, um, in uh, 2017, there was a huge, very important public debate uh, in Canada newspapers, and it you know, percolated a little bit to English also. Uh, Banu Mehta wrote a very important uh, essay in uh, the Indian Express as part of his columns. I wrote, uh, I had published an essay in, in the Indian Express in August uh, around the same time, and then there were other essays, you know, written in, in uh, Deccan Herald and LSE blog, uh, The Wire, and all the major online publications also had reflections on this. Uh, the Canada debate is far more interesting because it affects uh, people. And, and so there were two positions which were being articulated, you know, well-known positions, basically. Uh, one position was that Linga is different from Hindus and Veera Shaivas, right? So the anxiety now is partly because of the separation which is being advocated between Linga and Veera Shaivas, not just because of uh, you know, the distance which, which is uh, being uh, you know, created with the Hindus. So uh, in this Lingayat uh, you know, uh, specific debate, their origin, origin accounts are taken uh, are, are traced back to the 12th century and to the Vachanakaras, the Vachana writers, authors. Uh, so many hardliners from Congress and uh, um, other parties, excluding BJP, uh, started making this argument vehemently. Um, and they were supported by one group of matras called Viratha Matras. Uh, the key figure in all this, the key intellectual figure in all this is a retired uh, IS officer called S.M. Jamdar, a very interesting uh, uh, person, and in my mind, the most influential Lingayat historian of our times, even though he's not written, I mean, he's written some essays these days uh, in recent times, but he's not someone who's married you know, who, who's been a scholar. Uh, so how, how has he managed to insert himself into Lingayat historiography? What he has done is he's recreated two kshetras, Kudala Sangamayan and Vasava Kalyana, in this historiographical image. And he did that over a you know, uh, course of 20 plus years. So if you go to these places, you know, every single uh, uh, feed is something which reminds you of a very specific Past. So visually and you know by creating monuments, so he's sort of converted these places into museums. And so uh, anybody who goes there, you know, uh, buys into that that vision of what uh, Lingayat past is. So in that sense, he's been a remarkably important uh, opinion maker, someone who shaped the narrative um, with regard to Lingayat past. So he has been front and center of this uh, of this uh, controversy and has been writing a lot about uh, uh, how Lingayats are different both in the pre-modern past and in the contemporary world. Uh, and two cases he has made basically, you know, he's argued that Lingayats have a distinctive life cycle ritual and a priestly class uh, distinctive from uh, Hindus and that makes them you know, a separate religion. And he has talked about uh, their sacred texts and, and, and so on. The archive that they have inherited has also been a uh, you know, marker of difference with the Hindus. And uh, then he gets into some nitty-gritty sort of uh, discussions in the 19th and 20th centuries about 
how in colonial censors um, uh, Lingayats were counted and, and, and the errors which were made in that. Uh, he does not have a lot of you know, scholarly support to make those arguments, but, uh, but that's besides the point. Um, so three questions, uh, I want to say, emerge from this debate. The first is, is Virashaiva and Lingayat one and the same? So that was one particular source of anxiety. The second is, what is the relationship of Lingayats and Virashaiva to Hinduism? Is it within, are Lingayats within Hinduism or are they separate? Something that we have already raised. Um, and the third and, and most critical question in a way that is at the heart of this controversy is, what is the role of the state in all this? Like, why are you dragging this? Uh, if the Lingayats was, were to simply say, we're not Hindus, nobody's going to object to it. It's only when um, they have to make an argument which would fulfill the state's requirements. Right? Particular historical discourses have to be produced. And uh, that is one reason why, you know, uh, in, in, in a way, uh, we can show how uh, each of the historical discourses which are produced about in our communities past are produced in such dramatic moments. And uh, what this controversy helps us is to recognize that fact. Right? We actually create historical knowledge in, in times of you know, radical questioning and flux and, and so on. And so that, uh, how do we actually overcome some of that is, uh, is, is a significant question. So why are Lingayats not simply making their arguments to the society as a form of self-assertion? Why do they want the state to accept their claim? Right? That's the So before providing answers to these questions, let me briefly walk through some of the terms that I'm using here and sort of outline um, uh, the history of those, although some of that may be superfluous to some of you here. So the term Lingayas denotes a person who wears a personal Linga, the aniconic form of Shiva, on his body. This linga is both a distinctive marker of the community and distinguishes the bearer from other Hindu Shaiva devotees. A linga is male or female receives his personal linga during the initiation ceremony. Membership is not by birth alone, as in a caste group. Anybody, anyone, regardless of caste or gender, may be initiated into, into this community. Thus, lingayats have historically been an open community, enabling them to create a large, diverse social base. And one of the arguments has been, one of the you know, key questions in this is, when is this you know, large social base actually being constituted? Uh, Lingayats want to argue that it happened in the 12th century. Uh, you know, Virashaivas want to argue that it happened much before. Uh, but if you're a uh, reasonably competent historian, you would push the date further down. So that's the you know, history part that I'll get to in a minute. The practice of wearing a personal linga can be traced back to pre-modern times, often to the 12th century radical Bhakti movement led by Shaiva devotees known as the Sharanas, those who surrendered. These devotees came together in Kalyana, the capital city of Chalukya and Kalachuri kingdoms. Basuvanna, an official in the Kalachuri court, was their patron. Hearing from different castes and professional backgrounds, uh, the Sharanas composed Kannada poems known as Vachanas, something many of you are familiar with. And now it's considered to be part of a Bhakti literary corpus. So until now, more than 400 Vachanakaras or makers of Vachanas, including 60 women, have been identified. Right? And their corpus has been published and republished often by the state also, right? and, and uh, published and sold in very subsidized, uh, uh, subsidized rates. So it's an important project for the state also to keep this Vachana archive in public circulation. So Vachanas, like other bhakti compositions, are outpourings of devotion towards Shiva. They contain virulent criticisms of contemporary social and religious practices. Uh, and in some ways, you know, Vachanakara stand out uh, among amidst other devotional poets for their strident opposition to temple worship and you know, caste and so on. Uh, but that's also something which is contested by Virashaivas who say, uh, you know, there are fewer references to um, caste, for example, in the Vachanas themselves. Uh, and, and the opponents of caste system, um, the Lingayat historians are actually making a bigger deal out of this than it actually is. Uh, so be that as it may, um, you have the Vachana archives and then you know, narrative poetry which comes out of this, which then outlines what happened in, in these 20-30 uh, years uh, of a radical social movement in, in Kalyana. So one influential foundation account of Lingayats 
traces its origins back to Baswana and Vachanakaras. This account distances itself from Hinduism, rejecting the primacy of Vedas, Sanskrit scriptures, Brahmin priests, and temple worship. <coughs> so if they are creating an alternative life cycle ritual uh, pattern, it's, it's based on this account. Um, Vachanas are considered a sacred text by this group, and uh, personal linga itself is the object of worship. Uh, Professor M.M. Kalburgi, who was assassinated three years ago, was perhaps the most prominent intellectual ad uh, advocate in recent times of this account. The second term, Veera Shaiva, literally means brave or heroic Shaiva, and is often found in pre modern Kannada narratives and inscriptions. I mean, both these are used interchangeably. Uh, and in my own analytical work, I found it easier to talk about Vira Shaiva, uh, use the term Vira Shaivas for the pre modern past and uh, Lingayats for the modern period because the idea that you distinctive, you, you, you know, uh, 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 identify someone who wears a personal Linga through the name Lingayats is a distinctively census uh, intervention. Right? So it is census which brings attention to that. Because how do you mark out difference? And this uh, material practice gives them one way of uh, creating that separation. And so, um, in my own work, I've sort of tried to use Vira Shaiva for the pre modern past and Vira as for the present uh, for this reason. Uh, even though, you know, interchangeably both names have been used historically. Um, even in Vachanas, actually, Vira Shaiva is found far more frequently than Vira. Like there are 60 odd mm -hmm. uh, occasions uh, where Lingayas might, uh, we might come across Lingayas, where there are, whereas there are literally thousands of occasions where you come across the term Vira Shaiva. Yet, in the present debate, Vira Shaiva means an intimate relationship with Hindus. The proponents of Vira Shaiva's, uh, Vira Shaiva identity propose a second foundational account, and this is something which is frequently associated with. Uh, a uh, group of matas called Guru Matas, uh, Panchapita Matas. Um, the prop, uh, in according to which, Virash according to this second foundational account, uh, Virashaivas predate Baswarna and his fellow Sharanas. They argue that Baswarna only revived and popularized an already existing Virashaiva tradition, which had been established by five ancient sages. The practice of wearing a personal linga is accepted here, but it's seen as only a uh, an initiation ritual rather than something which gives a great deal of uh, social, um, uh, uh, creates a social identity. So um, while temple worship and Brahmin priests aren't important in this second account, the Sanskrit corpus of Vedas and Agamas and especially commentaries on Shaivagamas, the Shaiva commentaries on Shaivagamas are accorded primacy. The memory of five uh, uh, founders survives through the Panchapit of the five matters, which provide the institutional basis for this tradition even today. I mean, some of these uh, pontiffs are up in arms and in, in, uh, promising a Dhamma Yuddha against uh, their opponents who have created this false controversy and, you know, and, and importance to Lingayats. Still, Virashaiva Lingayats, uh, these two terms have been used interchangeably, especially since the 19th century. Note that the umbrella organization of modern Linga, it's Akhil Bharata Virashaiva Mahasabha, has Virashaiva in, his, in its name. Uh, now it has actually uh, been split, and there is a, a, a Jagatika Lingayat Mahasabha, a, a, a universal Virashaiva Mahasabha, so to speak, that the Lingayat uh, proponents have uh, uh, created. Um, in fact, what is actually ironic is it was the Virashaiva Mahasabha which had petitioned. For minority status to Siddharamaya Haske for uh, his government's support. So let us return to the questions that I asked in the beginning and look at what the historical evidence say, uh, says. So, first, the question of the difference between Virashaiva and Lingayas hadn't been posed so sharply until now. In the 20th century, as I talked about earlier, differences in competition among Lingayat subcasts had produced anxiety within the community. Such disunity, Lingayat leaders thought, might lead to significant loss of influence in democratic electoral politics where numbers matter. Therefore, Virashaiva Mahasabha had attempted to reduce competition among subcasts and uh, matters, enhance political unity, and so on. But what the chief minister had asked, as I said earlier, was a pragmatic question. 
if you want to actually get minority status, what name should we use? What should be our self-narrative for you? What should be the discourse we should put in our report? So as I said, in the past, Bira Shaiva wasn't accepted by the census authorities or by the minority ministry at the central level. And so the contemporary expediency uh, now was to produce a narrative which would be acceptable to the state at the uh, state level and at the central level to the government. Um, so the two accounts, the foundation accounts, uh, I want to suggest in this debate and historically have influenced bulk of the historical scholarship on the Shaiva Lingayat past and in my view has led to significant distortions in scholarship itself. Uh, instead of looking at you know, the origins of Lingayat community either in the 12th century or in the past before that, what I've tried to do in my work is to suggest a different uh, originally moment. I mean, it's a uh, risky argument to make in some ways given the political reality of India. But what I've suggested is uh, the making and remaking of the Virashaiva Lingayat community has been a more complex and layered process. Numerous Shaiva traditions from 11th, 12th century to the 15th, 16th century coalesced in, uh, in bringing together diverse discourses, narratives, beliefs, and practices. Um, and thereby producing a Virashaiva self, uh, which actually becomes really visible uh, in the 15th century Vijayanagara. You know, prior to that, it is very difficult to uh, identify a uh, very clear you know, Virashaiva self, because even in the narratives, you don't come across well thought out uh, arguments. And Vachanas themselves are not available in texts which were uh, put together before uh, the 15th century. And therefore, uh, even though Vachanas was said to have been composed in the 12th century, you know, the textualization of these Vachanas occurs only in the 15th and 16th century. They, at that point, uh, you know, they are given theological frameworks and narrative frameworks, and past accounts of these movements are reworked. And so uh, you can see even in these texts how a number of uh, practices and markers of identity which are associated with the linga, it's including the wearing of the linga, the importance of you know, initiation, uh, efficacy of many of their uh, practices are all debated in, you know, in, 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 in almost sociological terms, they're not theological debates, but uh, social arguments being made in favor of these, uh, uh, these, these practices, thereby creating grounds for the expansion of the community. And so what we then see is a different kind of process uh, of planning, uh, uh, unfolding in front of us, wherein um, Lingayats as a, uh, Virashaiva Lingayats as a community don't emerge because of the teachings of a charismatic teacher or a group of Vachana poets, but through a more uh, a complex process in which uh, contradictions are being resolved, like multiple communities, multiple traditions, Shaiva traditions are being brought in. And that is something which comes through in the uh, 15th, 16th century narratives and theological words. So uh, if I were to make you know, some of this in, in, in two uh, uh, succinct points, first, successive generations of Kannada poets and Shaiva theologians have used Vachanas and the life histories of Vachanakaras to appropriate and merge different Shaiva traditions. And that you can easily trace in, in these narratives and theologies. How, uh, by reconstructing the genealogies back to where they were, where these ideas were coming from. And second, you know, they produced an open community which allowed for conversion. Right? And this is different from other similar uh, uh, in, uh, interventions in, in uh, the second millennium AD, perhaps with the exception of Sikhism. Right? If there are parallels, it's only with Sikhism because this is a community that allows for people to come together. Uh, and though, so this expansion of uh, uh, social uh, base of Lingayats, in my view, happened in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, and perhaps even beyond, uh, as these contradictions were resolved and you know, more open, openness was uh, created. Uh, but this history is not something which is uh, uh, even uh, uh, 
considered by, by sophisticated commentators in this audience. Larry and Rodriguez are uh, political scientists at uh, uh, JNU previously and now at Ambedkar University, wrote an op-ed yesterday in the Indian Express where he completely misses the point because he wants to you know, derive the radicalism of, uh, of Lingayats from that 12th century moment, whereas there are multiple sources of radicalism, multiple sources of uh, the self which, come, which coalesce much later to create this Lingayats discourse. So there's that past there, right? So in my view, this, this historical um, 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 understanding of of uh, uh, of Virashaiva past, Lingai past, which is which is driving this debate, is a faulty one. So then, how should we understand Lingayats and Virashaiva? Is the question that we are left with? Are they a protest group which nevertheless remains within Hinduism, or do they constitute a separate religious community like the Jains, Buddhists, or the Sikhs? There exists enough doctrinal and narrative resources to offer compelling arguments to support both the positions. That's the key. Yeah. So you can make both the cases and uh, and convince state authorities and convince. So the burden then is on Virashaiva Lingats themselves to decide not only their core beliefs and practices but their relationship with Hindus. So that's I mean you know it's, it's a common sense thing in a, in a sense. But the problem is because Lingayats want Indian state to affirm their distinctiveness from Hinduism and accord minority status. Uh, in the past, such representations had been rejected twice, um, and therefore, Siddharamaya's question has no significance. What is the argument that we should make? Uh, we, should, we can also note that Ramakrishna Mission, Swami Narayana sect, have also been asking for uh, minority status, and there was a news report yesterday that. Jews have been trying to get minority status, and it's only in uh, in uh, Maharashtra that they recognize as a minority. And there are about, about four and a half thousand Jews in India, and their numbers are dwindling. But you know, it is an important demand, right? I mean, they are the ones who actually require minority status because Lingayats don't have any problem maintaining their distinctive worldview or you know, that they the self or their life cycle rituals. The Jews who require. <coughs> So, uh, so there is that. There, there, there are these all these debates uh, which have been going on, and, and should also add that Jains went through a similar struggle for almost two decades before the demands were uh, accepted uh, in the uh, uh, in three four years ago, just before the previous Lok Sabha elections. So, regardless of the historical and doctrinal justifications Lingayats may provide, their demand for a minority status has to do with practical considerations, political considerations. There were two rationales for a, uh, that they, uh, you know, uh, there were two arguments, rationales that they provided, and uh, um, they had uh, an earlier demand uh, to get a separate census entry on a number um, uh, which would accord actually, so uh, they could be counted properly in uh, in the census, um, and they thought that would help them to e get either reservations or minority status. Um, I'll explain the rationale in, in just a second. In the past, Lingayats consistently argued that in the absence of caste census, which was stopped in 1931, their numbers have been underreported. So in, in 1999, 2000, 2001, they had a massive uh, agitation, you know, roadshow, and, and, and you know, that took them to all the different districts of Karnataka. It started in one uh, religious uh, uh, sacred place called Ulavi in uh, north. West Karnataka and went all the way up to Vasu uh, Kalyana, which is in the northeastern corner of, uh, of Karnataka, but covering the entire, uh, uh, all, all the districts of Karnataka. So in that um, uh, campaign, their argument was that uh, historically, Lingayats have been, uh, not been counted properly, and if only uh, they are counted properly, uh, their, you know, the number would come up to about two crores which would then enable them to um, make an argument for backward status because um, the greater the number of people then, uh, you know, the number of people who actually own um, households, you know, socioeconomic indicators which are important for backward caste status, including educational accomplishments within the community, uh, the number of people who own pakka houses, you know, those <coughs> kinds of uh, 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 
uh, category, uh, um, uh, criteria are, are uh, uh, seen and, and more the number it becomes easier to establish backward status. That was their argument. So um, an accurate counting and concomitant collection of socioeconomic data, the guys believe, would reveal their backwardness, thus allowing them to again secure reservation. So this is in some ways reminiscent of uh, what Jats and Marathas and Patels, Patidars have been asking uh, in their respective states. Uh, if such was the rationale until 2001, now the Lingayat reasoning has broadened. The minority status would enable Lingayats to secure exemptions and preferential treatment, preferential benefits for their educational institutions. Consider the fact that Lingayats organizations run four private universities and thousands of educational institutions, including technical and medical colleges. Um, a rough, you know, back of the envelope calculation would uh, tell us that there is at least, in the education sector alone, uh, there's an investment of upwards of $10 billion, and maybe as much as 15 to $20 billion. Um, so these are assets, businesses that the uh, Lingayat community is, is running. Uh, you know, the matters are private trade initials. And so, you know, not being subject to um, right to education, which means you have to reserve 25% of all your uh, school seats, especially uh, to uh, neighborhood children, right, for which state would uh, uh, compensate them, but they don't get, you know, an equivalent amount of money that they would make otherwise in, uh, uh, if they were to keep their uh, schools as a private business. So uh, those kinds of considerations are not being subject to state regulations on admission and so on. That helps them actually to make more money uh, and to keep these businesses solvent and profitable. So uh, just not being subject to RTE alone will bring a windfall to Lingayat institutions. But on the other hand, if you also don't have to follow reservation laws, then you can recruit only Lingayat. Right? So those are important practical considerations which have driven this demand. Um, such motivations have brought together even ideological adversities. And so, you know, the conclusion, if I were to make a couple of points, uh, it's important, you know, in, in, a, in a very revealing moment, the uh, Congress politician who's leading um, uh, the uh, Lingayat agitation admitted in September that, you know, they had celebrated Ganesha festival at home and that kept the Ganesha at home, and it was not a contradiction in his mind to ask for, and he openly said, we have no problems, you know, we, we don't have any ideological differences, we want this status for uh, you know, pragmatic uh, uh, institutional benefits, you know, which uh, they could secure. So, um, so there is that. Separate life cycle rituals, but also adoption of all the up, you know, upper caste, middle class Hindu practices, such as Narayana Puja or you know, Ganapati festival, uh, and worshipping uh, an image at home, no problems with any of that. Uh, at the other extreme, now, Virashaivas are saying, now it's a done deal, right? So uh, don't give reservation, uh, don't give minority status to only those who say they are Lingayas. Extend that to Virashaivas also. So, I mean, in a sense, there was never a, uh, never a, uh, uh, a controversy, never a difference, you know, uh, in, in attaining that ultimate goal, which is the minority status. Uh, but uh, it was about what kind of argument that they would have to make in the public sphere and how that might impact their self-conceptions. So, um, pragmatism triumph, triumphs everything else, and therefore, uh, they are reconciled now. They want a share of the pie. Uh, and does that does this actually impact any of the um, um, either everyday life or uh, um, anything else? It actually doesn't because um, no, I'll just read a paragraph that I wrote recently in response to this. Um, so, what changes as a consequence of this entire debate is that uh, this entire controversy is that 
uh, Congress, which had no way of actually talking to the entire community because they, had, they were the ones who had taken away reservations before, now can say, okay, here is a share of the state resources that we, we can give you. Right? And therefore, um, it is, it's not the number of votes that they might get in the, uh, in the elections, but this newfound ability to address the community, to engage them in a dialogue, is the big political windfall that they're getting. But on the ground, nothing changes. No marriage uh, alliance is going to break down. Uh, no other you know, ritual uh, practices will, will change. Uh, so insofar as everyday life is concerned, insofar as other social practices are concerned, this controversy makes no impact on any of that. But it happens at a different level and for a set of considerations which are uh, 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 of pragmatic value. So uh, the two points that I made earlier, right? Like one is um, Lingayats, are they Hindus or not? You know, it's a, it's a uh, question that they have to resolve themselves. But for us, I think, um, the scholars, uh, this is the question of probably like histories of communities while navigating all these historiographical uh, uh, diversions. Um, and that's the tricky question. Uh, one of the reasons why I've, I've been sort of obsessing over uh, the Lingayat case for the past two decades is because you know, here is one clear instance where the distinction between history and historiography collapses while we begin to write histories. So I, there's no way I can give a talk about, about Lingayats just by looking at some texts and not look at their real world implications, not just in the 20th century, but through history. And so how does an account that was, you know, account of the 12th century movement, which was produced in, in the 13th century, like what, are the, what are the implications of that in the 20th century, 21st century, continues to be an important question. So, uh, so in a sense, writing the history of Lingayats has always been a project of writing histories of the present, rather than just doing textual work or um, doing a historical work of a certain kind where you reconstruct an event or a past. Because past is constantly reproduced and it, uh, in, in, you know, in, it's one of those unusual cases, there are very few such instances where there is so much representation of, of the self, uh, such constant you know, uh, reverting back to the, their formatic, what they consider to be their formatic moments. And that's the history, that's their history from 13th to the 21st century. And so each of these controversies in a way enable us to sort of, you know, make one more cut into that past and, and, and perhaps explain the present rather than explain what happened in the past. <coughs> I'll stop there. I thank you very much. Um, would you like to take your questions or shall I? So thanks, Prithi. That's all very interesting presentation. This whole case is very interesting. But now, if I understood you correctly, now aside from the political and pragmatic advantages to being declared a minority, you know, such as the Forty or whatever, when it comes to these specific religious uh, categorizations, uh, aside from these things you've mentioned, do any of these people actually offer any doctrinal differences that distinguish Lingayat slash Lira Shaiva from Hindus, which, it, which is a very notoriously difficult category to define anyway. Uh, is there that argument made at all, or just like we want to be a minority or something like that? Uh, no, it's, it's, I mean, even historically from, uh, uh, we have the Sanskrit archive, mm -hmm. uh, Siddhanta Shikamani, mm -hmm. Sripati Pandita's Pashya, uh, and, and <coughs> but that is, uh, uh, so, well, how they differ from Shaivas in general? So, what, yeah. what's actually interesting is whether they make an argument for a separate community in sociological terms. Uh, what is interesting is you have uh, discourses which are being produced in the Kannada speaking regions, both in Sanskrit and in Kannada, mm -hmm. theological texts which are being written, which uh, connect back, which, which take recourse, you know, uh, uh, with respect to uh, the conception of the sthara which is an important category for uh, Lingayats or uh, Virashaivas in, in marking their spiritual progress. Right. So here, someone like Magyar Mahideva, who is writing in Sanskrit on the Mahasutra, Sutra, or uh, a Kannada theologian like Tonta uh, Dasi they're both you know, using some of that. So there, there are genealogies which take us back from this 15th to 16th century uh, textual universe, Kannada and Sanskrit, 
back to these uh, Aradhya inspired or Shaiva Brahmana inspired uh, 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 commentaries which are being written in, in Telugu speaking regions or elsewhere. Okay? So the, uh, the point is not that they are producing difference. The difference is being produced here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and the uh, arguments which are being made are somewhat complex because they are engaging in conversations with, uh, with, uh, um, with um, yoga traditions, Shaiva yoga traditions, with uh, mystical traditions. Um, apart from you know engaging with Karamukas and, and and others who had institutional resources which they are interested in appropriating, so then you have this um, this textual uh, project in which Sanskrit influence can be found. Uh, you know, the, uh, commentaries on Shaivagama, mm -hmm. commentaries on uh, uh, Brahma Sutras or independent texts which have been written by Siddhanta Shikamani. Mm -hmm. Their influence you can trace. But all of this actually, really interestingly, is, is framed using Vachanas as the uh, template. So those ideas are actually replicated you know, using Vachanas, mm -hmm. either in the commentaries to the Vachanas themselves uh, or in, in, in narratives. So uh, the production of difference happens and it's a sociological fact. You can see that. But it does not happen just by using Vachanas. So other theological resources are marshaled, but they're some friendly to Sanskrit, some you know, not having anything to do with producing a different with, uh, difference with, uh, with the Brahminical traditions or Vedic traditions. But the rhetoric of, of Vachanas, of being, you know, uh, anti-Sanskrit or anti vedic so Upanishads is used e to bring even those traditions. Yeah, but you see this in Tamil Nadu also and this kind but of not in this, uh, no, yeah. not to this uh, extent. To say non vira Shaiva Shaivas recognize them as Hindus, but they think of them as different from Hindus. I'm just thinking of looking at it from outside the community. How do other people view them? I, I mean, it's not like the Ahmadiyyas in Islam or something, they're an excluded group. No, no, I mean, they're right. for the past 150 years, they've been, or perhaps even you know, before that, they've been used, uh, viewed as a caste. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're appropriating them within this hmm. that spectrum. So the, uh, the point about difference, which is produced either in scholarly arguments or in popular perception through life cycle rituals and so on, that is expedient. That is, you resort to that whenever it is necessary. But it has a disproportionate impact on how we actually perceive them. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the discomfort that you're expressing. Yes. Right. In dramatic moments, it comes out. But otherwise, in normal times, you know. Right, yeah. <coughs> what about the assassination of this journalist, Gauri, so and so recently? How does that fit into the politics? Uh, there is a, a suspicion, I mean, in recent times, you know, more and more people, there's a little bit more evidence to that effect. But one strong uh, 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 suspicion that investigators have uh, entertained so far is that um, uh, it's Hindu extremists who have done this. And one of the reasons why there are two theories which are proposed as to why they were upset. One is her strong support to the Lingayat argument. She wrote a long essay in The Wire, uh, very problematic historically, but <laughs> that's the standard position that people so there's that. And then she was also helping Naxals, uh, Naxalites in Karnataka to reintegrate themselves into mainstream uh, politics. So th both those things had uh, you know, upset uh, Hindu extremists. But yeah. so that, those are the theories. Yes. Yeah. What is the Muslim population in India today? Muslim population, 14, 16%. I think it's actually around a little less than 13 yeah, from uh, last figure. 12.6 or 12.8. 12.6 or 12.8, I can't remember, mm -hmm. but just, just under 13%. Under 13%. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, where the Hindu part of the country? It's around 80. 80. 80. Mm -hmm. Any particular part of the country? Spread all over. Another 13%. Yeah. Yeah. Very uniform distribution. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, thank you again for a fantastic talk, uh, but 
was wondering if you might say a little more uh, concretely about, in your opinion, which uh, particular lineages or branches of uh, either Virakta or other monastic institutions are especially active in this movement over the past year or so? Uh, even among Viraktas, you know, there's, there's a split. Uh, there are some, the Ubali and Gadag uh, Matha, especially the Gadag Pontiff has been very active. Uh, but the other influential Southern Karnataka uh, Mathas have been quite silent. The Sutur Matha in Mysore, the you know, Pontiff hasn't opened his mouth. Uh, there was an effort to uh, um, you know, bring in uh, Shiva Kumara Swami of Tumkur Matha uh, into this. Apparently once he, you know, one group said they got his blessing, then the next day, the same evening, the other group went, because he's the most vulnerable, 190 years old, uh, seen as uh, the embodiment of all that is good among the guys. And and so they had a stroke and can't. Yeah, he can't. I mean, we, we had his darshan. Can't talk yeah, yeah, no, he, he does his lingo puja. He does his yeah. actual lingo puja every day. But they carry him back and forth, and he was a he, brilliant man. Yeah. He hasn't spoken in public in a very long time, and so, you know, nobody knows whether he's actually capable of uh, expressing himself cogently, but uh, in understanding the capacities of the issues. But the Mata has taken, a, I think, a, a soft uh, stand to support this movement. Um, and there are some in the central Karnataka, Sirigere, and they've all been sympathetic, mm -hmm. but they haven't gone out um, aggressively. I just want to uh, ask a question of my own, if I, if I may. It really struck me that, you know, when you were saying that you would date the origins of the 15th and 16th century under Vijayanagara. So it seems like either in the pre-modern pre or the modern period, we're talking about state formations, you know, either the pre-modern or the modern kind, that then have a role to play in asking questions about origins and yeah, developments, yeah. right? So instead of thinking about origins, you know, devoid of these kinds of questions of state uh, patronage in the one case maybe, or state bureaucratic apparatuses that demand the kind of, you know, uh, yeah. language or history writing, it, it seems to me that that is one productive way of thinking about it. Um, I've written extensively about this because uh, if there's one really interesting, uh, you know, um, if, if, if there is one way in which the guys have been exceptional, is it, it is in, in, in uh, you know, sort of creating a community outside of the state patronage. Mm -hmm. So many of the intellectual projects that I was talking about earlier, about 15th, 16th century in general, are not supported by the state at all. I mean, they've been in the margins of the state. And the state has, and afterwards, they try to appropriate these other kings into their uh, projects in their narratives. But historically, I suspect you know, nothing of that can actually happen. So, I mean, even from early days onwards, right, the uh, 12th century Vachana movement, um, I mean, the one uh, way in which that movement has been uh, framed is to see that as, as uh, being in opposition to the state. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the movement petered out in the 12th century Kalyan in the, in the 60s, precisely because it, it was seen as a threat by the Kalachori kings. And so, historically, until the middle of the 20th century when they became really important political actors. They've had little political power per se. There was small, you know, feudatories here and there who were playing acts. But historically they've relied on their martyrs as institutions which have supported them. And that is also a post-15th century phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. So state is, you know, in, in, in a real way absent from this entire narrative. Until recently. Until recently. And I've always found um, this is a useful <laughs> way to frame, you know, how to study communities also because uh, if I'm writing the history of the second millennium in, of India, right, when linguistic communities, ethnic communities, um, other kinds of caste identities are actually uh, taking shape in the way that we recognize them than today, right? Um, so there's a different kind of history of the communities that I can write. Exactly. Uh, and that has nothing to do with one major preoccupation for South Indian historians, especially which is safe formation. <laughs> right. Okay, so, there's a question back yeah. there. So there's something that you said which struck me, which I found very interesting, the idea that how everyday life doesn't change. Yeah. So on social media also, a lot of people are posting is that let's take the status <coughs> and the government can't do anything about whom we pray to or whom we worship right. with pride. So does that become a major reason why the masses sort of end up giving support for an idea like this? Because for the masses, nothing is changing. They are probably just gaining part of whatever they get in terms of the minority benefit. And 
Right. And my second question is like, would this be enough for the Congress to at least get some support among the Lingard men and through that probably some mobilize, mass mobilization of Lingard in the election? Yes. Um, they will certainly get a little bit of support, partly because, and this is in response to the first question that you asked, uh, they can get actually some, you know, some share of the state resources which they could not have prior to this. And so for 40, 40 odd years from 1970s, mid 1970s, right when they lost reservation, you know, they've actually uh, not gained a great deal of uh, state patronage uh, in a formal sense. Right? Uh, the mutters have been influential and therefore they've gotten some uh, resources, but this gives them uh, greater access. So uh, it's in some ways, you know, just like the demand that uh, Patels are making or Marathas are making, it's the just pragmatics of it. Right? So therefore, um, if even if it, you know, how many government jobs are there? So in a few thousands, and um, Lingayas, Africans alone would be, you know, millions. And so it's not as if they're going to benefit greatly. It's just that symbolically having access to it is a huge thing, right? And so those are the uh, uh, reasons why history gets rewritten. Two questions. One, you mentioned something about Kurukshetra, and there is some version of it that uh, has been. No, Kudala Sangamati. Oh, it's a different. I thought you, uh, some some area was sort of has been right. developed and. Right. Yeah, that's the Kudala Sangamati. That Sangam. Kudala Sangamati. Uh, it's it's a same Kanada, space. In Karnataka, Kanada, Kanada, Oh, okay. okay. All right. And the second one is, is you know, you brought up like the Patadars and the <laughs> Jars and the Marathas. Has there been any sort of, I mean, what does it mean for their sort of calls for minority status? And the other thing is, has there been any backlash against, you know, the Lingayas getting a minority status? Because when I kind of read about it, I'm thinking, okay, that's <laughs> really rich, you know. Uh, uh, there's been some backlash or some concerns expressed by especially Muslims said, you know, their share, or Christians, their share might get uh, diluted. Um, but, I mean, that could be true when it comes to funding, but if the process is to basically um, uh, get recognition as a minority um, educational institution, you know, then it doesn't affect them. So there's that. And actually, I asked, I did a long interview of uh, Chandar, um, uh, the IS officer. I asked him one question, and I in, even in my articles I raised that: uh, Is it ethical? I mean, it, the guys may have an intellectual case to make, but is it ethical for them to ask for minority status, given that they're a dominant community and they don't need state support in order to maintain their distinctive lifestyle? And you know, I mean, they recognize it's a good question, but they sidestep that by saying we have too many poor people. We have to ensure they get some you know, state support. So. It's such an interesting question because all the Indian constitution also makes a strange distinction between Hinduism and religion versus Hinduism and law, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And yeah. I, I wonder how that will, a lot how of, that sort of speaks to it. A lot of technical arguments have been, you know, uh, on, on these grounds. Uh, where uh, Lingayats are placed under Hindu marriage law. Uh, yes, marriage so, act, yeah. yeah, marriage act, and therefore, why should they be recognized as uh, a separate religion? Because right? uh, I mean, is a default category in the Constitution. Yeah. Right. Everybody who's not one of these are right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, but, but you know, there are also changes mm -hmm. which are coming about. Mm -hmm. Ministry of Minority Affairs did not exist until 2006, I think. Mm -hmm. and and so afterwards, there's a separate act that they've uh, uh, contributed. So in uh, 2000 and 2001, when the Indians were asking for a separate uh, census code, they went to the Registrar General Census. They didn't go to the Minority Affairs Ministry. It didn't exist then. So now you have a different avenue. And that path was opened up by James, who were asking for a minority status. And uh, you know, that emboldened the Indians. I've got one more question, I guess. Uh, are there Muslims in, uh, like, say, the Bay Area? Uh, kind of Muslims, like, from India? 
Are there Muslims from India in the Bay Area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are there any Muslims in, thousands, in thousands. the Bay Area? Thousands. No. Thousands, thousands. A thousand. Yeah. You should you should go to some of their mosques. Okay, we have a question. Yeah. I'm curious about your thinking about the relationship between the space that is opened up for self fashioning and the space of being outside of state governance uh, in the post agenda world. Uh, but I've been writing a lot about this in terms of the old and medieval. Yeah. And in terms, of, I think there are many more continuities with the Virashaiva mode of being as a sociological formation uh, with what's going on in Kalamuka, these vast Kalamuka land grants where they are the juridical authority uh, in space. And where, if we look at the Pratishtat Tantras that are being used, quite explicitly, the king formally renounces. All the moment the chariot goes and marks the terrain, all juridical rights in perpetuity are renounced by the state. Uh, and in some ways, I think there's an interesting work that could be done in thinking about Virashaivism as a pre Hindu past, part of a pre uh, early modern Hindu past, as a story more of continuity than a story of a, a continuity with social formations that die out most other places? Uh, I mean, if you're mm -hmm. specific, you. Specifically, you know, looking at the relationships and contrasts with the Karmuka yeah. uh, case, I mean, even looking at the inscriptions and some texts which exist for the 9th, 10th, 11th century period and what happens in the Linga Virashaiva case in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, I, mean, I see you know, uh, much of what you're saying um, in terms of what the state does. Um, and, and how it enables for autonomous self fashioning on the part of Karl Mukherj. Um, my own sense is, um, I mean, while those kinds of uh, presidents exist, we don't have probably enough to write, write a niche, rich sociological narrative of how that kind of self fashioning uh, occurred. And uh, I mean, one of the fascinating dimensions of Virashaiva case, especially using Canada sources, is precisely to write in sociological terms, right, not in theological terms, about cells which are being fashioned through dialogue by deploying and redeploying uh, literary sources or linguistic utterances, as is the case with Vachanas. So narratives come about, you know, and then there are um, anthologies of Vachanas which are formed in particular theological framework, mm -hmm. the frameworks, uh, commentaries written on them. So all of which gives enough space for them to thrash out uh, what does it mean to be a Vedashava in, in uh, terms of practice, in terms of distinctive markers of identity that one has on body and so on. And so that makes it a uh, sort of interesting, rich uh, case. And there are very few, I mean, if you're thinking of Kapi Panti, so even Sri Vaishnavas for that matter, mm -hmm. right, as a comparable case. Uh, this kind of sociolo sociological account, you know, that, that's my hunch, uh, is difficult to produce. Right? And, and the community which is in, in existence, which has representatives from you know, all the other castes uh, within it, right? that's difficult to see. And, and they're open in a way that very few are. Yeah. I want to know just where they worship and the Muslims worship and pray. The I don't know what much of this talk means. is not about. Uh, it's, it's about Canada and Karnataka and a certain politics there. We should sort of confine our questions to that. Uh, maybe I'll ask one last question if nobody else has one. Um, I think perhaps one thing I'm thinking about is the history of origins. I mean, when do you start? When do communities start thinking about origins? Right. I mean, I, so maybe that's what you were suggesting in the 15th and 16th century that becomes a, a preoccupation. So can we say something about the, the history of origin narratives, um, you know, either within this community or yes. more broadly? Because as you were suggesting, I mean, right. these beginnings are always going to be fuzzy, whether it's Hinduism or whether it's very specific mm -hmm. sort of sectarian. I mean, you're never going to find the origin story. Yeah. So the concern, when do, why do people become concerned with origin? No, when and under what circumstances? That's actually a fascinating question because one of the other things that I did, a separate project that I did, is to look at the representations of Kalyana in all kinds of narratives, classical mm -hmm. poetry, folk mm -hmm. poetry, uh, historical accounts, modern plays, modern novels. Mm -hmm. So 
if I want to write a kind of social history, cultural history of Kanda speaking people of the second millennium AD, what I choose, you know, is this city Kalyana and its representations. Mm -hmm. So what I'm suggesting by that is there's this tradition of representing what happened in 20, 30 years in the city of Kalyana, especially with Pachana Kavars, which has been an absolute obsession with with Kannada speakers. And they've gone back to it, they've written thousands of uh, poems. And they've used these poems um, or you know, um, <coughs> theological works for their own social projects. The most um, successful of those projects has been the project of British Shaivas and the United So we have to make one, I, I would make one distinction here. You have thousands of these appropriations, reappropriations, revisions, representations of the narratives on Kalyana. And within that, at one particular point, uh, a set of ascetics you know, called Virattas, inaugurated a new project, which becomes quite central in the making of your There are others, uh, many which are untouchable communities today, which have produced rich, 30,000, 40,000 uh, lines long epic poems using this as the beginning. So it is a moment of origin for a variety of communities, but Lingayats have been most successful in appropriating it and submerging their history with it. So there are, I mean, the way they do it is by questioning uh, uh, accounts of, uh, um, of 12th century and from 13th century itself, 13th and 14th century accounts of that are questioned by the ascetics who create a, uh, a new origin narrative. And so uh, that is um, a very different. Uh, one small, small question. I think I it's Hindu. I would leave it to that. I would leave it to that. You can't because people find themselves. You can't say yeah. Very, uh, I mean, I I have no investment in, yeah, in answering yeah, that question. It's, 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 it's up to them. That's yeah, all. Yeah. Well, these identities. I'm just surprised that the Jews don't have a minority status. I was. I didn't I know, know actually. That's until I didn't know yesterday. Yeah. And actually, that's necessary given the. Uh, casual anti-Semitism, yeah. uh, or the glorification of Hitler in India. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that, that doesn't preclude a huge, uh, you know, Israeli tourist. Yeah. It doesn't, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of this recent book um, about great leaders mm -hmm. of the world, sure, sure, which sure. had uh, Nelson Mandela, Obama, Hitler, Hitler. and Modi on the cover. <laughs> yeah. and, and then the Simon Wiesenthal Center yeah. had to sort of object, and then they. My book has been one of the. Uh, most popular books as well, history books as well. Yeah. 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 Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.